The first Métis were children of indigenous women and European fur traders in the Red River area, now known as Manitoba. It dates back to as early as 1973 during the Alexander Mackenzie expedition. The Métis people developed their own language called Michif, which is a unique blend of French and the Cree language that is still used today. Roughly 33% of all Canada's Aboriginal population is Métis. Métis means mixed. The Métis Nation Blue Infinity Flag is the oldest continuous used flag in Canada and it represents the mixing of two cultures. Métis were often called flower beadwork people due to their combination of French floral embroidery mixed with Aboriginal porcupine quilt work. Métis are well known for their finger woven sash, which is referred to as l'assumption sash, and it is the most recognizable symbol of Métis heritage. The sash was often used as a belt, tow rope, tump line, or even as a sewing kit. They're made of wool. Louis Riel was a Canadian politician, a founder of the province of Manitoba, and a political leader of the Métis people. He led two resistance movements against the government of Canada and its first prime minister, John A. Macdonald. Riel sought to defend Métis rights and identity as the Northwest Territories came progressively under the Canadian sphere of influence. Louis Riel Day is on November 16th. The Métis Nation of British Columbia was founded in 1996 and is still going strong today. Thank you for joining uh, the Northeast BC Métis Storytelling Project. As you know, this is a project that is geared towards uh, elders sharing their stories uh, and any wisdom or any teachings that they want to pass on to uh, current and future generations, um, especially for family members that may get to know you or not. Uh, and it's just, it's great to pass on all of that information because as you know, throughout generations, we lose some stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that in mind, uh, why don't we begin um, with um, telling us a little bit about yourself. Let's start with your first name and your last name. Go ahead. Uh, Wayne LaRiviere. Okay. And um, do you know, um, like, were you named after someone? No, I was not. No. My middle names, yes. Both of my grandparents. Okay. Um, Louis was my dad's father and Daniel was my mom's fathers from Wayne Lewis Daniel. That's really nice. And uh, now Wayne, what about your um, your last name? Do you know any lineage or any stories for your last name? Not really, but my dad, he came from the States. Um, and my dad's side of the family, there are a lot of French names. Lavalley, Prontos. So that's where the French side. My dad did speak French. Do you speak French? Yourself? No, only since uh, grade eight. Standard, we had to take it. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, Wayne, do you have any nicknames? Um, Frank. Frank? And how did you get that name? Oh, my, my uncle Donald, who is just my age, a little younger than I am. He comes up with nicknames for everybody, so... Well, Frank just came out of town. <laughs> I'm known in town as Frank, but only in Dawson Creek. Oh, really? Okay. Everywhere else, Wayne? It's Wayne. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's just a family little. Gotcha. And um, are you Métis or non-status? I'm Métis. Métis, okay. And um, which community did you come from? From the Paddle Prairie Métis settlement, northern Alberta, until the age of of I, th I left there at six years old to come to BC. So I started grade one at five years old because my birthday is right after Christmas. So I was allowed at five to go to school. So you had to wait till six years old. Um, and then I started public school here in Dawson, uh, Pooh Oh, that's really nice. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe let's talk about a little bit about your parents, if you don't mind. Um, your mom, do you know your mom's side, where she was from? She was uh, from Northern Alberta as well. Um, don't really know the exact place, it'll come to me. But she um, grew up in the bush, so the, those were a lot of the skills that we learned from her. And my dad, uh, coming across the line at such a young age, I think he was my age, around five or six when they came to Canada. Wow. Um, 
and he was the youngest of his family, and they were French speaking. And where did they come from, France, or where did no, they come they, from, Quebec? Uh, their roots are um, Alberta, East. Your mom, but same with your dad. My dad's—that's uh, my dad's side. Oh, okay. Um, and my mom, uh, Northern Cree, so she spoke her language. Um, before English, she learned English in, I believe, grade one or grade two, when she went to public school, so. So Métis, or sorry, Cree was the first uh, language spoken at home for you as well, or no? Well, no, it was English. It was English? Yeah, uh, we didn't know French at all. Uh, we learned what Cree that I know of, I can read up there, uh, <laughs> from just growing up, my cousins, because uh, I'm older than them, um, but we learned from our grandmother and from the parents. Um, it wasn't a casual conversation. It wasn't talked like that. Uh, but I remember um, coming home from school, the elementary school, eight, nine years old, grade five maybe. But we had Cree lessons from me and my younger siblings. My mom would always make sure we, we learned Cree right after school before we had our, our late lunch. Um, and then we can go to sports or do whatever we do. But yeah, and my grandparents spoke Cree full time all the time. So we learned just by listening. Listening. And now, okay, so I'm glad, I'm glad you brought up your grandparents because I was going to ask about them too. Mm -hmm. uh, on your mom's side, where are they from? Do you know? Uh, Northern Alberta as well. Okay. And what about on your dad's side? Um, I believe my great grandfather, grandfather was born in Southern Alberta, but his wife was Okay, gotcha. Um, and then they, they came up and uh, became citizens. Well, and then my uncles went, his older brothers went into the war, fought for Canada. Yeah. Okay. And do you have siblings? Yes, I do. I'm the middle child. I got two older and three younger. Okay, so that would be six? Six of them total, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. And what was it uh, like being the middle child? I had a lot of work to do. Um, I rem remember I eating my suppers faster because I didn't want to have to do all the dishes. And that was putting the water on. Um, if we didn't have running water at that time, this was infamous. It came later. Because we were just outside of the village. That, so anyways, um, and then uh, doing the chores, uh, I have had to um, sweep and mop the floors, for example. So that was my job because by this time, my older brother and sister, there's four years gap between my sister. So they were already gone by the time they were 17, graduated from high school. So I was looking after the other three. It was a chore, but why not? It's something we, we um, we learned early and my mom taught taught us how to clean and how to uh, maintain a home and we still pretty much do that to this day. Wow, that's incredible. And um, <clears throat> let's talk about maybe um, a little bit earlier than that, just so we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, you said you were bo born in Alberta. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the hospital? Or was I was born in Peace River. Um, hospital. Um, I never went back all my life until uh, um, a reunion in, in Alberta, my, my uh, dad's side. I went to Peace River for the first time. So I would probably was in my 50s. So I, I, I was just born there. That was it. And you just took off? Oh, yeah, my mom, I was born right after Christmas. So I think it's probably Christmas shopping. <laughs> and I was happened to be born. <laughs> there you go. And um, do you recall any other interesting stories aside from being a Christmas baby for your birth? Like, do you, do you know if it was like a very difficult birth or? That, I don't know. Um, later, when my mom was, you know, getting into her mature years, she starts sharing a lot more stuff that, because I, I wasn't around her for a lot of years of since, uh, and that's another story. Um, but no, she, you know, it, 
It was from a divorce, so I left with my dad, so I lost a lot of crucial time with my mother, because I left with my dad when I was 13. Yeah. So it's really hard to kind of remember stuff that yeah. I should have remembered when I was in my teens and 20s. Of course, yeah. And um, <clears throat> let's maybe then talk about some of your childhood stories then, mm -hmm. uh, growing up. Um, what was it like uh, growing up for you? Well, in Paddle Prairie, we uh, lived near the creek. The creek um, was quite low, so there's a big gorge. And we were told never to go there because it could topple off the edge. Um, but in the wintertime, that's where we learned how to skate, was on the creek. Um, and my mom would take us rabbit hunting. So this first time I shot a, a gun and I must have been about six years old. And she would, would be walking on the creek bed in the wintertime, best time to hunt. And they're white, so you can't see them. So she would just whistle and the rabbits would pop up from behind the stump or wherever they were. And then she would ping them off and they just flip through the air. Uh, she was very good marksman. And so that's how we learned to, to do a lot of this stuff. Um, being my age, I didn't do a lot of stuff my older brother did. I didn't learn how to ride horse till much later. And, uh, you know, I just, um, it was a wonderful time to grow up because we had no electricity. It was all uh, coal oil lamps um, and wood stoves, so there was no furnaces or anything like that. And I remember the the really nice designs the frost would make on the windows, and that was on the inside of the house, wow. with you know just the condensation, make these beautiful, you know, like it's God's God's work. I swear, just stunning. Beautiful designs, eh? Yeah, I and mean, the light would, the moon would come through, and it just be really colorful. But those are the good memories I have. We, um, and how would you have been at that point? I would have been four up. Uh, five years old, plus five, six, because I came to BC when I was finished grade one. So I must have been seven when I got here. Gotcha. Um, but I remember wearing our mucklucks in the wintertime that Tad has made for us with a rabbit fur that probably my mom had skinned. Um, and they're very comfortable and very warm. That's really cool. Now, what was it like when you got to BC from then on? It was, it was fine because we, went to school right away because we moved during the school year. So um, we were registered right away. I, I was because my other younger three weren't in school yet. Um, I made friends really fast because we, we had relatives here that came before us. Um, and we, we spoke English, so we did, you know, and uh, it's a small little town, so um, you're in a classroom of maybe 20 to 25, and you're together since grade one to grade 12, if you stay. But here, uh, with a city so close like Dawson Creek, when uh, we got uh, grade eight, we came to town, so it's a whole different story. You, you lose that little mm -hmm. security or, uh, of friends and everything, because you meet totally new people. Right. Right. And do you, did you guys live now at that point when you moved here within the city center? Mm -mm. No, no, we, we still lived, lived uh, outside. We still lived outside. Um, Poos is six miles, Poos six miles from here. And we just lived on the north side of the tracks. So that's why we didn't have the running water. So, and it was um, indoor washrooms, but you had to take the bucket to the outhouse to to, to uh, get rid of it until the water we had electricity and heat mm -hmm. but there was just no uh, no plumbing no plumbing and that happened later on but I was gone by that time gotcha mm -hmm. now <clears throat> how has life changed maybe um, let's start with you said you went back and you were 50 to where you were born mm -hmm. Did it all change from what you remember big time? Um, I don't remember anything, really. What I found Peace River to be 
uh, was a very nice looking community. Um, so I really have no connection there, except I'm registered in their hospital. Gotcha. And what about here? And I'm sorry? And what about here? Here? Uh, when I come back, this is my home. So uh, throughout my years, um, our family had a baseball team, a dynasty, if you will, for 20 some years. This was my uncles and cousins and friends. So we played men's fastball. So we brought a lot of, um, I think, honor to this city uh, because our name was so well known. So when I come back, my uh, memories are of all those fantastic times I had with my cousins playing ball. Because it was a, it was a, 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 a team and a group effort. And uh, it's not that we didn't want to play with other people. It was just that we were... Um, a Métis team and Cree team, First Nations team, I was, yeah. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to your parents. What did they do uh, as far as work growing up or were they, either of them, just looking after you guys? My mom was at home all the time. My dad was a truck driver in his entire life. Um, being the youngest of his family, um, they learned machinery really well on the farm, driving the old uh, tractors and combines. And so he learned a lot of those skills very early, driving. Uh, was driving way before, I'm sure he had a driver's license. Um, so my mom was raising, raising kids. Um, and then later on, she became a childcare worker in Dawson Creek here, so she was, she would, would send off to school and then she'd go to work. My dad was gone about 80% of the time. So, and this is for short durations. Right. Yeah, but. And did you yourself uh, work while you were growing up to uh, support the family in any shape or form? Um, no, I probably much just did it myself. Because when I lived with my dad, he was gone a lot. And I was in grade 10, grade 11, grade 12. <laughs> um, so I remember once when the high school, somebody ratted on me or rat, because I was being left alone at 14. And, and that was not right according to you know, the standards. Of course. So I wouldn't answer the door when I'd see these people I didn't know come up and knock on her door. So my dad was gone. And uh, th that was his livelihood. He had uh, payments and he was gone six days. I was quite okay by myself at that age. As you as you know, and uh, because we'd already had the, the, the skills, the life skills that our mother taught us. Um, and she prepared us for those times, especially those years that you knew you were going to be alone. And I was able to uh, to uh, go to school, get myself ready. I did everything myself. I had friends over. You know. Everybody knew I was living alone at 14. And uh, But I was in contact with my dad a lot. Um, so that kind of phase, up, they just kind of gave up on me, I guess, because I wouldn't answer the door. Wow, it's very different. Very different. So I started working after school, around grade 10, grade 11. So I would have been about turning 15. And what did you do? I worked in a movie hall, uh, cleaned it on the weekends and after schools. And I worked in a dish, as a dishwasher at 16. All these were after school because uh, I was pretty much committed to school. I didn't, I didn't really skip or... It, just wasn't something we we did. We're a small little town, so uh, why skip? <laughs> you had more fun, better fun at school than skipping. <laughs> but that's great that you're able to find different jobs after school. And um, now, where did you go to school? Speaking of school, here in Dawson Creek till grade. I uh, finished grade nine here. In which school? Uh, Central Middle School. It was called. Back then, there were two high schools in town, one up on the hill, one here. 
Um, and then I uh, went into start grade 10 in Fort Nelson. When my parents divorced, I moved with my dad because I was closer to him at that time in my life. Um, and then I uh, grew up up there. So I didn't have a lot of contact with my three younger siblings via phone or I'd fly down from Fort Nelson to Fort St. John and get picked up and come. Back then was only a 20 bucks. Back then. Back then. <laughs> but you needed a standby card. Oh, okay. Remember those standby cards? So it was only $20, a nice flight. Um, otherwise, it's eight hours from here to Fort Nelson, then by, by driving. Now it's four and a half because the road is not straight. Right. Wow. And um, <clears throat> do you remember any good stories from maybe like high school or anything like that? Any, any memories that stick out to you? Gosh, I remember um, grade, our grade 12 trip it was um, a trip to England. So my dad paid for that. I didn't know how to ask him. It took me a lot of courage. <laughs> but... Uh, um, I think growing up in the north, I'd, I'd never been on a subway before. So the uh, first time was over in England, of all places, London. Um, and I got sick because I couldn't handle the movement. Yeah, Could have been jet lag too because we were quite tired. And we flew from snow to green grass. And a lot of, so a lot, a lot of good memories from those trips. Um, Another one was, uh, because I love the North, I, I'm very outdoorsy, I, I spent a lot of time outside. Um, canoeing 210 river miles in the Yukon at 16 years old with, uh, with friends and took us 12 days. But that's something you do when you live in the North is you have to. And uh, I'm not a hunter, my older brother is the hunter. I'm more of the, um, I'm the painter, the, the, the artist who paints these things. And, uh, um, and that's what I really enjoy, uh, enjoy about myself is um, my connection to nature and uh, not so much an activist, but I do support what issues, and especially relevant to today's issues, climate change, et cetera. I'm very aware of, of sensitive issues like that. It's So it's part of your interest to follow up on those and to stay up to date on some of them? It always was an interest even in, in my teens because I chose to be outside all the time. You know, the sunshine and everything, it's, you know, it's, it's what I enjoy. All right, um, what about, um, a little bit of your perhaps maybe family life. Did you get married? Did you um, have a partner or anything like that? Um, I was never married. Uh, and partnerships lasted. Um, sometimes the timing wasn't right. Um, for example, to have a family when, you know, the, the time and, and a man's life um, it sits with you for that time and you want boy, girl, healthy, something, of, you know, when your footsteps, you know, follow you. Um, so when that was with me, it wasn't with the partner. And then when it was with her, it wasn't with me. <laughs> it tennis game, you know, <laughs> back and forth, back and forth. So eventually the 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 flame dies and, and uh, in the way you go so i because of a lot of my traveling and, and stuff i uh i chose that nomadic type lifestyle and i was able to see some incredible things and often i wish i had somebody to share these incredible views that i've seen uh albeit on top of a mountain <clears throat> or canoeing in the river or um the sunsets uh, wildlife things like that and a lot of times that somebody wasn't there. How about um, your work? So you said you're an artist. Mm -hmm. 
and um, tell us about, I, I hear that you made this behind you there. Mm -hmm. So uh, have you always been an artist or is that something that developed yes, later it on? Came, came later. I, uh, because of, of my uh, love for nature stuff, I went into a, a outdoor recreation type lifestyle. So I, I got um, graduated from numerous programs, especially for um, outdoor recreation. So I teach a lot of that. Um, and then I became a park warden at a very young age, 22. Um, so I worked for Parks Canada in Glacier National Park. So that was um, a lot of stuff that I already had learned because of my, uh, my courses. Uh, riding a horse helped a lot because it's, you got to do park patrols. Mm -hmm. uh, weapons, because um, you, you have to shoot bear darts, to, uh, tranquilizers, things like that. Uh, warden doesn't wear sidearms. Oh. So the, the weapon's always in your truck. Although you are a peace officer, because I had to take a law course as well. It's part of my training. So then I had to learn how to uh, powder ski, um, rock climbing. I begged my first 10,000 foot peak. I was very excited about that. So, you know, all these, these uh, lifestyles that happened to me very early. Um, I wish I was 32 and did that because then I would. How old were you when you became warden? It's 20, I was going on 22 years. And where, where was that? Uh, Glacier National Park. In BC. In BC. Mm -hmm. And how long did you uh, work there for? It was a little over two years. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to, you know, expand a lot on it, but it's a lot to, because we're, Rogers Pass is one of the worst highway corridors and avalanche corridors in Canada, mm -hmm. if not North America. Mm -hmm. um, looked after magnificently by the park. Um, however, we do have our traffic accidents and I was seeing two, I see my first fatality motorcycle crash and I had to, you have to touch. And be, so maybe it was just too much at such a young age that I was put into a position that I, I wish I had more um, experience as a, as a as a man, if you will, that I was able to cope with these things. Um, however, the beauty of it and the, uh, the plus side was I got a, a really good molding on myself. So um, after I did a career change and I went into the uh, visual and performing arts, so I, um, I studied in Toronto for four summers. Cool. Uh, toured a lot of Ontario with touring shows stage managing and things like that. So this is where the art took off because um, I knew I always did it, I always doodled, but now I was being trained by some of the best. And I learned a lot of different techniques. So I'm working as a scenic designer, um, you have to make a wall look like a brick wall, you know, you, or uh, you can make it look like planks. So I learned all these really neat techniques and then, and, um, and then I, I ran a theater school for quite a few years. And uh, some of uh, the graduates that I'd auditioned and worked with are seen on television to this very day on some of the hot, hot TV shows like Blackstone and all those shows, yeah. Um, and I remember, Cla um, I should mention your name, but I remember my name being mentioned here on award um, one of our graduates had won Best Actress. And how nice is that? So, you know, the, those are my accomplishments. I was able to pass a lot of my life skills to the younger generation. And they had their dreams. And I'm just very flattered that I was able to help them pursue that. And um, in reality, to teach them that it's not light bulbs and fur jackets and limousines there's uh there's a lot more work yeah 
there is way more way work and, and and you're in the media yourself so you understand the, yeah. how how focused you have to be yeah mm -hmm. now speaking of you know passing on um sort of that knowledge to younger individuals mm -hmm. did you have anyone in your life that would that you would say influenced you the most perhaps like a, your mom or your dad or maybe like a grandparent um i would say probably all four combined because i learned all those my parents and grandparents um because we learned at such a young age all the outdoor skills that we would require had we not moved into the to the towns we'd still be on the settlement uh trapping uh, hunting and uh fishing um and then there's the uh, the the entertainment and the music the fiddle playing the jigging uh, as part of our culture so you know all those still i still retain except the fiddle i don't know fiddle um and then my grandparents of course because of the language and um bannock making and i made bannock to this very day um and you know all all those wonderful storytelling the stories <clears throat> the stories that we heard my grandpa would play the fiddle all the time and uh, at their home and he'd be jigging with his his feet and you know that's quite the skill right there he didn't have two left feet as for sure um and then my dad of course um his um people skills because he was meeting so many people i learned a lot of that from him of how to approach and how to act and how to do things like that because i i needed those i was in a different town and if i wasn't that type of person i probably wouldn't have any friends i probably got beat up a lot <laughs> um so he he it, he always supported my my athletic um, <clears throat> abilities and he was quite um, quite happy for them even at times at 16 when I was rebelling I wouldn't go to pick up an, a sports award because I thought it was and it wasn't I was just hanging around with the wrong crew let's not go there it's, it's <laughs> so. boring and I I knew I was getting a a sports award I think I won junior athlete of the year that year and I thought it was just something I wasn't going to involve myself with but eventually I did sneak in and picked up the award in time <laughs> at least you did I did I was on the stage and <laughs> there you go and uh would you say that um today you do certain things a particular way because of your parents and your grandparents you mentioned you make bannock did they teach you how to make bannock actually that was my grandmother's recipe it's just cut in half she would um instead of 10 cups of flour I use 5 because I'll, it'll make 24 biscuits where my grandma was doing this faithfully every day and making soup for people friends and family were constantly dropping in they had the, one of the biggest homes you know and all of the smell of the the bannock and fresh soup was uh, mixed in with the the lilac bushes outside me quite a good memory of growing up because you never went hungry you didn't even have to go home to eat because grandma always had <laughs> had enough to eat um then often we'd get in trouble for staying too long um but yeah i i would i would say all of that for were were uh, uh were magic in my uh my existence and things i decided to pursue things that you did that you um perhaps you said you know you spent a lot of time outdoors mm -hmm. are there certain things that you do like outdoors when you're in the bush that you know you did them because that's how your parents taught you or your grandparents taught you um i would say yeah uh, i would certainly do that um you mentioned you don't hunt but no. you still spend a lot of time outdoors yeah so what do you like to do when you're actually outdoors um i do a lot of walking and i still do um I hike so so much and I I go to places that I know are a danger to me because often I'm by myself so I really got to be careful there. Um and I still do it even at my age now. 
Um, do you do like any like berry picking? Oh yeah, we we pick uh, Saskatoon's for jelly and jams and stuff. I don't make them in Princeton, um, and we're um, we're grateful to get the results. <laughs> Put on your bannock. Um, yeah, a lot of that. Uh, I enjoy fishing too for my food and stuff like that, but I don't actively shoot, yeah. and I don't trap. Now the fishing, though, you did say that your parents taught you those skills. My mom was a avid fisherman, fisher person, um, when I was in my 20s and uh, when we were starting to scope out our own lives. Um, she was always fishing and so we spent a lot of uh, really nice moments as a family or just uh, her, her and I and me just watching in my 20s just watching her um, because she'd spent hours and hours on the shoreline or a lake or a river or any place and um, she caught her first huge salmon in Campbell River on one of those nice expensive trips you can pay for so you know she she did a lot and I, I uh, do you have any techniques that you use from your mom when you go fishing um, I enjoy ice fishing which she really enjoyed so it's just drilling the hole and waiting. I mean, that's the skill, I guess, is is is, uh, is um, perseverance and just wait, 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 wait. Um, because there's no guarantee. Um, and those are some of the stuff that I enjoy and I learned how to, and I, I really enjoy the winter fishing. Do you remember growing up or maybe at any point in, you know, your, I guess, uh, later years, any like upheavals or any big changes in your life uh, for you or your family? Like, were there any tough changes that really stuck with you? Um, I think the only changes in albeit unexpected is the tragedies of losing a sibling. Um, and I wouldn't say so much in upheaval, but there's just the upheaval, there's trauma there too, and then there's trauma and and losing a family member, cousins, you know, something that you're close to. Or, um, so, you know, there's something like that. Anything that sticks out maybe culturally, like over the years, do you remember any major changes or shifts culturally that you felt for yourself or any, or your family? Um, I would, again, just uh, changes as a people, yeah. Um, and what happened then, even when I was growing up, we knew about the schools and everything. So that was a major changes and it was often talked about. Uh, my mom and dad never went and, um, maybe they, I, I know that my mom hid her family, hid them, um, because the, the, the representatives are, in, in, I don't know what they're called, um, were in the area. So, and it's affecting us now, even at my age, because we're the generation of all those sad children that never made it home. And they would be my age, if not older than me. Um, and what do those people go through? So, uh, upheaval, yeah, that's a pretty big word. I share their their uh, their uh, their sorrow, for sure, mm -hmm. as a as a community member. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were there any organizations, or maybe um, any ways that you felt in your life drawn to to support your community, like to? I mean, I know you said you liked you know certain political issues or things like that, but were there any other things that you were directly involved in in your community growing up or later on as an adult? Mm -hmm. First was the athletics, right? Um, and then I got a couple of murals hanging right now in Dawson Creek. One's on the college. It's uh, ten by twenty feet, I think. It's it's uh, I redid it, up. and um, so that stuff I'm giving back to the community is is stuff that I learned when I wasn't here. 
um, back when we still don't have art schools. So this college in Dawson Creek, I think, is, is doing brilliantly for the trades industries. Not so much for anything if you want to, like any other rural or smaller city, you have to travel great lengths to achieve what you want to do with your life. Um, careers. Um, yeah, so that's something that I've given back. I think it's just my knowledge when I do come back here. Mm -hmm. I'm able to work with youth and uh, young adults and even adults to uh, to share and because and, and, uh, I have uh, art classes and stuff like that. Oh, you still teach at the college? I don't teach at the college. I have a mural. Out. Oh, I didn't know if you still, like on top of that, also taught or something like that. No, it's all... Um, uh, contract work. Gotcha. Yeah. So you're able to hold classes and stuff. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about um, your parents? Were they part of any community groups or any organizations growing up? Um, my mom, I think, was more community minded because my dad wasn't around. Mm -hmm. um, uh, belonging to the Friendship Center and, and uh, working with uh, as a home support worker um, and then coming from that baseball family so that was always uh, was a, a, a big thing because I think through tournaments and representing the city you brought the honor back albeit third place first place which have so the press was very aware of, of the, the accomplishments of that I mean, that's my mom's family. So they never dealt in politics. Because um, coming from the Métis settlement, we don't have chiefs, if you will, or but we do have councils, and it's called the chief factor, would be like um, the one in charge of the, of the colony, or settlement, I guess they're called now. Yeah. Um, what about... Um any supportive or influ influential like elders in your life aside from your grandparents? Did you ever meet any interesting elders? I did, and that's uh, when I was working as a warden. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're so, so green. Um, and thrown into such a wild environment. Um, I was taken... Um, by the, the dog handler, he must have seen some something in me that he he liked, or mm -hmm. uh, and then he groomed me, and he taught me a lot of the stuff that you can't learn out, out of the book because it's all hands on. That's where I had to learn to ski within a winter um, because of search and rescue. Um, for example, because he was the dog handler and I was the smallest one, that often I was uh, the victim. So they'd build a, a hole, dig a hole and bury me. All I had was a radio and the snow was right here. So if you moved, it would, and good thing it didn't collapse. So this was so the dog could sniff the victim out because of avalanche they had to find the buried snowmobile or skiers or that. So I was actually, uh, you know, alive. <laughs> <laughs> and it was quite frightening because you can't be claustrophobic because you don't know how long you're going to be there. Sometimes it was less than, you know, I'm guessing 50 minutes to 45 minutes because the dog, once it knows there's a call out, it gets the excitement, the adrenaline starts. He would have fought me right away, but they, they, Gordy would take him. Um, and yet it was scary there for me. Uh, another time, I don't want, I think this is kind of important, especially for young people who are uh, looking for challenges. Mm -hmm. They certainly are there. Um, I was dropped off on a, a, the edge of a cliff I brought big rock jetty out and it was sheer cliff on either side, so you really didn't want to move. If you're afraid of heights, that's not a very good place. 
So I just had to lay down and try not get blown off by the wind or anything. <laughs> and um, I was, uh, again, uh, mountain climbing the victim. This is for the other wardens um, who have to fly in and pick up either a person who's alive or uh, a person who is deceased from falling, usually mountain climbing accidents. So we had to learn all this stuff. So I played the victim there. And I was put in to what they'd call a jenny bag. It's like a sleeping bag, but the laces. Yep, going across. Up, and then there's the hook right here um, for the hell to take me up. So um, it was kind of hard again if you're claustrophobia is another bad spot to be because you're you're laid down here and it's up here and all you can see is the rope in the bottom of the helicopter. You have no idea where you are. Um, and this was, the, the flap was covering my face and with the downdraft of the chopper, you know, you're kind of choking basically and I can't yell to the other warden because he's got headsets on and so if you were the rescue, you'd be sitting as you are now, but I would be in a prone position laying across you like this, my head's over here. So we we had no communication. And this thing was, the flap had came out and I was tied right in. So I just had to gag over that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, these are some of the things that I did as a rescue. So it, it grew me for, for a lot of life because I'd seen tragedy up front. And um, the memories are still there. Um, they'll never go away. Um, I'm glad I did it at that age. My bones were, you know, beat up so bad <laughs> from flipping in the skis and my twisting my knee and having to ski out with a damaged, you know. It's well, a toll on you. Yeah. So. Again, I wish I was. I had 10 years of life experiences before I entered that. And uh, yeah, that's, I can that's, share. But it gave you some really cool stories to tell, so that's amazing. Lots, a lot of good stories. And, and Gord Peter was, was so magic to me. He, uh, he um, gave me some incredible advice and showed me a lot of skills. And this is outside of a family member, but that's who you want when you come out of uh, fresh out of university college, you, you, somebody will pick you up and, and, and see some belief in you. Yeah, that's a great person to have. To have as a mentor, yeah. I remember I worked, uh, another one that shared some um, wise, very wise words with me. And I did some casting on his uh, film. But I remember I shouldn't mention his name. Uh, he took me aside and armor on me like this and was in a parkade and we walked. He said, come with you, I want to talk to you. And he told me I was doing such a great job at what I'm in. Keep in the business. We need people like you. And I'm so glad you're working on my film um, and sending your incredibly talented people. I was on set because I was asked to. Um, and um, he became a mentor and I got some nice letters and stuff, notes through another uh, casting director, a nice photograph of us all. And um, I remember those words of encouragement because that's such a, a hard field to even break into. Um, your name is so, so important and once it starts circulating, you got to be so careful and uh, keep updated and uh, um, really protect your name because that's what gets you, is getting you the work, is your reputation and stuff. So I was very careful about that. I, uh, I worked hard to get my name in there. Um, in, in, yeah. Actually, his name was Martin Sheen. Cool. Yeah. So um, I'm glad I can mention his name. Um, and th those are some of the mentors that I remember so clearly like it was yesterday because 
the honesty was there, like Gordy did with me as a warden. And, uh, and the belief was there. And when somebody says, hey, you're doing a, a really good job, I'll run with it. <laughs> because those aren't, those words are so infrequent. And uh, once it happens, I think it makes you feel good. And, and, uh, um, and the feeling of feeling good is just an incredible feeling. So those are, I think, the two most important men of my two careers outside of my family um, that I admire the most and I still do. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. They gave you some great, um, I guess, life skills mm -hmm. and also some great mentorship that way. Yeah, and uh, the, 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 the people skills that we, we, we are taught at, at an early age. Yeah, exactly, which sometimes you need to learn that outside of the home. Outside of the home and, and that will bring you your, your many successes is, is, uh, is what we learned as a, as a child. Yeah. The question here is, you know, what were the differences in, for your family like? So for example, uh, during the summer, did you go do something with your dad? Or in the winter, did you, I know you went ice fishing, but do you remember any particular things for each season that you would do either yourself or your family? Um, I was with my dad a lot on the highway. Um, he'd take me out of school on a Friday. Um, and I'd he'd say, well, why don't you come with me? I'm, I'm going up to Fireside or Liard Hot Springs or somewhere. Watson Lake, and we you know that's, that's a long ways. It's it's an overnighter for sure. So those were, I um, I spent a lot of time with him in those seasons. Um, a lot of times I took my homework with me, so I just do it bouncing down the, in the gravel truck, um, and then catching naps. Um, so growing up with him, he. Um, I was able to see a lot of country I would not have, have seen, and that that's also involves my brother, older brother, who is the hunter. We went on a buffalo hunt up at Ping Mountain. We did get the buffalo. Wow. Um, he he's taken me to some incredible places um, on horseback, uh, on quads, on foot. Um, so yeah, those uh You guys a lot of driving with your dad? Yeah. Um family um uh, I remember growing up my grandparents having picnics um towards the Alberta border. So all the family would come there and and that was a nice outing for us because we didn't travel much. Um we never even came to town and now I I walk there and back two or three times a week, and that's 10 kilometers there, 10 back. And I follow the old railway tracks. Then we never even thought of coming to town because we were having so much fun playing baseball. We started out Little League and then, you know, Pony League. And we, we didn't have cell phones and, you know, iPads. You felt like you had everything you needed out there. There was no threat because we, we started so young and that's why we became so good. Good ball players is because we started playing ball very, very young. That's really cool. Eight, nine years old and we never quit. I had, uh, I was in Fort Nelson, I'd come down and play ball, not the whole season, but that was sort of my obligation as a 16 year old. I had to come and play ball for my uncles and cousins to fulfill my, my part, of, part of the of the family dynasty, if you want to call it that. <laughs> I'd, I'd call it that. And that was 20 years, at least, of baseball. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are some of the things I remember so well. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. I guess those are some really good family summer memories. And those are the seasonal, you know. Um, my mom would take us berry pick at a, young, at a very young age oh. for uh, low bush cranberries and blueberries that grew because we weren't tall enough to reach the Saskatoon bushes, right? so we were designated the you know the low low food pickers, if you will. 
uh, the gatherers. Um, and I remember so well the false smell of the leaves and the cranberries is such a beautiful smell of the late autumn, uh, especially here in the mountain air. Um, you know, it's just the, the whole magic of this season. It's winter time I spent a lot with myself. Yeah. And um, what about, can you tell me about um, spirituality? Um, did it play, uh, did it play a role in your life or a ceremony? Um, perhaps for you or your family or your elders? Um, I would say probably no, because it was so far in between. Um, I have attended two sweat lodges in my life, being asked to participate. Um, I smudge. Um, I went to Catholic Church as a youngster because something that everybody did on the settlement was, and the priest would come to your house and stuff like that. So when my parents divorced, that sort of came to a screeching halt. We were never um, faithful churchgoers, but, and that's just from the circumstances that are in our lives at that time. Culturally, um, I've been privy enough to be to a lot of reserves, and that's through the entertainment business. We're able to take shows to some reserves. So I did learn a lot about the cultures because from what, what we do here, uh, it's a lot different with the First Nations of Southern Ontario, where we, we often were. Um, and I have seen a lot of nice reserves there, but everything is different. The language is different. The customs are different. The, the traditional wear is different. And, and, and uh, so you kind of find it fascinating to, to learn that culture. And I don't know, um, I would say not so much religious, but, but at, at universally everybody smudges in the, the eagle feather, so symbolic. Um, and as uh, Métis First Nations people, it's it's just a, a, some somewhat of a bond because you're welcome to their community. Um, and I learned a lot of that going to Ontario for four summers as I uh, progressed in the uh, theater school where I learned all this this training. Mm -hmm. And um, well come to the end, but I wanted to ask you if you wanted to pass on any knowledge uh, to any generations that may watch us in the future, what, uh, what would you say to them? Um, I kind of mentioned before, earlier on, um, have a goal, get your goals. I think that's important. And for sure education. I had to leave the North to be educated in the South because there's no such thing up here. Mm -hmm. So you have to make those adjustments and those commitments and you do it at such a young age. Um, and that's something that I would strongly recommend is, is uh, you have to sacrifice to get anything and uh, Education for sure is a strong part of my life because I continually learned, unfortunately, hands on. Um, but I learned, uh, I learned so much that way, uh, putting myself in very risky positions and um, being taken care of by your mentors. And I'm glad that I am one uh, as I have many things to share and uh, um, I continually to do it. Um, so that's what I would offer is, uh, you know, stick with your goals and follow your dreams. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this project. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that many of those stories will be passed on and appreciated by many generations. So thank nice. You. Thank you so much.